All right, so in this video, let's talk about Google Finance function. I'm gonna show you a few examples how you can get some stock prices or currency exchange information using this function. The way this function works, the first argument in this function is what's called a ticker. So what the ticker is, it's basically the exchange and the ticker that you want in that exchange. So to give you an example of that, if I do something like this, NASDAQ, and then do a colon, and then I can point to the ticker. So for example, let's say we're trying to get Google. If we do that and hit enter, that should give us the current pricing for that particular ticker from this particular exchange. So basically we separate the ticker and the exchange using this colon separator. Now, if you don't provide the exchange and just do the ticker, it will try to guess where it should get that ticker. Now, if there's just one ticker like that, it should be fine. However, if the same ticker appears in multiple exchanges, then that could create a conflict. So if you want this to be 100% accurate, you should do the full thing. But for right now, if I just do this, that should still give us the current price. Now, usually you might not want to have that hard coded here. So I could just go here and type the stock and then go here, replace this with a reference pointing to that stock and I should get the same thing. Now, in addition to this, we can also do a comma and say which attribute we would like to get. So by default, this is gonna be under price. So that's what we're getting right now. But we could also do something like open price. Uh, maybe it's price open. Let's try that. Yep, there it is. So it's price open, not open price. And there are other options here. So if you wanted to see the full possible list, what you wanna do, just click on this and get this list and click this learn more. And then over here, if we scroll down, we should be able to see this attribute, see all the possible attributes. So see there's like price, price open, we can get high, low. So we can get all of these options here. All of these options that I'm looking right now from this list, are from real-time pricing. This function will also allow you to get historical data. And when we mean historical, it could be like yesterday's price, like a year ago price or something like that. And if you do that, you're not gonna have the same attributes available. So if you go with the current real-time options, these are the attributes. However, we can also go to historical. So let's just get to historical. And the way you can get to historical, let's just change this to a price for now. What you basically do, you add a third start date argument. So if I provide a date again in quotes, so that should give us the price for that stock, January 1st, 2018. So I got no data for this. Uh, and that's probably because the market is closed on that particular day. So let's try a different day, like January 7th or something. Here we go. Now we got some data. So as you can see, we got the date. It returns this array structure. So it gives you the date and the close price. One thing you may want to do, if you don't want this whole thing returned, you just care about what this returns, the price, then what you could do, you could just put this inside of index function like this, and then after this parentheses, comma, I can do row two, column two, two, two. And if I do this, see, instead of getting all of that array, I will only get the actual price, which is the part that I care about. So basically what I'm doing here with this index function, if I just go back to the way this was before, so this gives us this grid, so inside of this grid, I'm going two rows down, two columns over, which gets us to this value. And that's what I'm doing with that index. So that's what this index, and then comma two, comma two is doing here. It just gets us that value right there. 
Now I'm just gonna get back to without index option and we'll continue here. So now we're dealing with historical data. So just to get back to that list, if I go to learn more and look inside of that attribute list right here, see this first list of attributes we get is not for historical data, this is for real time data. So if I keep scrolling down at some point, it's gonna give us options we have, see, for historical data as well. So these would be all possible options we could do if we're dealing with like, once you enter a date, then you're dealing with historical data. So basically I have open, close, high, low, volume, and I can do all. So for example, if I go back and change this to volume like this, that should give us this, see? And then I can change to all and that should retrieve all the possible options for historical data. Now, when you do the price, you basically just get the close in this particular case. So here I can do close, which is basically that. So now in this, you can also provide an end date. So I can say, give me everything from January 7th through February 3rd, 2018. And if I do that, and again, dates are going in quotes, as you can see here within the formula, and that should give me all of these, see, from here through there. So any day that the market was open, you're gonna get in your results, and any day that it's not, it's not going to give you that. So for example, you'll see how after January, 12th, it jumps to 16th because we have the dates in the middle that the market is closed. Now, another option here, instead of providing the end date, you can also give it a number of days. So for example, if I do something like 30, that would give me starting from January 7, 30 days. Now, when we say days here, we mean market days. So to explain you what that means exactly, let's change this to something like five days. So as you can see, five days, that gets me this two, three, four, five, right? So that gives me one, two, three, four, five days. Now, if I go back and change this to, let's say six days, you'll see that after 12, it jumps to 16. So that's basically six market days, not regular days. Now, another thing you may have noticed is that if I just go back to this, you'll see that as a date, I'm entering January 7th, 2018, but what I get is January 8th, 2018. And that's because January 7th, the market is probably closed. So if I go to January 8th, I should be getting, see, the same results. And I assume January 7th is, Sunday or something like that. So that means if I go to January 6th, that should probably bring us to a Saturday, which should also be closed. So you'll see how it gets us January 8th again. That's basically giving us the next open day in the market. So if I go another day back, like January 5th, that should see get me to Friday, which gets me January 5th. So basically what you're getting here is the first open day in a market after the date you provide here. And then we're still gonna get six period from that open day. So even though I'm entering January 7th, I'm gonna get starting from January 8th, six market days. So that's what I got. Now you can also have a reference for the starting and ending dates. So for example, I can do something like one seven, 2018 in the cell and then I can go here and take this off that's currently in quotations as string and just point to a date cell and hit enter. And again, I get my results. So as you can see, I get six market days from that particular day. So basically we have two options here. You can either do start and end date or you can do number of days. So if I do something like 30, it's gonna give us 30 data points. And finally, the last argument in this function is going to be 
the interval. So basically by default, it's gonna be in days. So it gives you daily. So one of the options here is by default is the one. So if I do one, that's gonna give me this. And the second option here is to do weekly or type seven. So if you do seven, that should give us the weekly pricing for that 30 day period that we've selected. Again, 30 market days, not 30 calendar days. So keep in mind that you cannot do like two, three, four options here. It's just one or it's seven. So you can either do daily or weekly. So let's get back to just one here. And finally, the other thing I wanna show you here is how we can get currency exchange rates. So for example, if I want to get exchange rate between let's say American dollar and Euro, the way I would do that, I would go here and do equals and Google finance. And as the ticker, what I'm going to do, well, the full version is going to be currency. So you start with the word currency, that's going to be the exchange. And then you do colon. And then after the colon, you start with the abbreviation of one of the currencies and then continue just together the other one. So something like this. So if I do this, close this and hit enter, that should give us the exchange rate. So basically one American dollar will buy you 0 0.84 euros. Now we can also do it the other way. We can do this and that will give you, see one euro will get you 1.188 American dollar. So here too, you can avoid doing this. So if I do this, it will try to guess what I'm doing. And as you can see, it got it correctly. So that Euro and USD. Now, one thing you may want to do, you may have like your grid here and you want to get the rate for all of these, right? So instead of doing this, I want to point to this on the left. So I'm gonna erase that. I'm gonna click on this and do ampersand to use concatenate and concatenate this to it. And that will create that exchange from American dollar to Euro. And then I can drag this down and you can see we get all of these exchange rates like this. Now, if you wanted to also make sure you have the exchange here, you can also concatenate that as a string here. So I'm gonna do double quotes and another ampersand and within this quotations, I'll do currency and colon. And that will give me the right exchange and then the rest. So there it is, that's the way you could get currency exchange rates if you wanted to. And the rest here should be similar. So if I do something for January 8th, 2020 or 2018, what's the 2018? And as you can see, it's complaining about it because it's trying to put this over here again. And remember that grid that it was giving me before. So if I just create enough space here just to start, see it gives me what it gives me. But if I wanted to drag this down, then I'm gonna put this inside of that index function and do comma two, comma two. And then I can delete this line and then I can drag this formula down. And that should do it for this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.